Hello and welcome to Around the Lens, episode 53. I'm your host, David J. Murphy. Around the Lens is a live weekly visual journalism roundtable show coming at you every single Monday night, for the most part, whenever we do something, or sometimes we don't do it on Monday, but anyways. Coming to you every single Monday night, uh, we talk about news topics of the year related to the world of visual journalism. Uh, we are recording this December 5th, 2016. My co-host is Zach Roberts. Zach. And if you want to connect with us, uh, you can head over to AroundTheLens.com and uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Around the Lens. Every week we feature experts in the world of visual journalism talking again about our craft. This week we are ple pleased to announce we have two awesome uh, panelists. Of course, our uh, ever-returning panelist, Ron Hamilton, and uh, Grand Master of Photography and Photojournalism and all things that we do in our craft, Jeff Widener. Uh, who you may have uh, heard has uh, his photograph of Tank Man, one of the most uh, iconic photographs recently recognized in the Time 100 Most Influential Photos of the Year. Uh, gentlemen, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves to us. We'll start with you, Jeff. Sure. Uh, Jeff's drinking his drink there, so I'll go ahead and uh, <laughs> remind people who I am. I'm Ron Hamilton. I'm uh, not a master of anything, but I am a correspondent for Eagle News in the Philippines, located, located here in Hawaii, and Jeff is visiting with us today. All yeah, right. I'm um, Widener. And I've uh, been a photojournalist since I was 15. Uh, I've been living in Hamburg, Germany, courtesy of uh, the Tank Man himself. Uh, during the BBC documentary on the 20th anniversary, I walked down the street and saw Pretty Blonde, and uh, the next thing I knew, I was married the next year. So if I ever find Tank Man, I definitely have a big thank you to him. <laughs> all right, all right, well, excellent. Zach, we haven't seen you in a few weeks. Where you been at, buddy? Uh, I've been kind of all around. Uh, I was down doing some work uh, and visiting friends down in Florida. And then before that, it's just been, you know, campaign stuff and, and travel and went to Dublin for a, uh, a, uh, a shoot uh, there covering a, uh, a TV show set. Um, my first ever uh, paid for junket. That was nice. <laughs> uh, for an entertainment side, it wasn't actual news or anything like that. So, uh, but other than that, just uh, trying to edit and actually go through the year's worth of photos, you know, trying to put together yeah. something. So, did you put anything together with your uh, your additional election coverage? You know, you were uh, talking about putting something together for that. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I'm I'm going to put together a uh, a book uh, of it, just kind of a kind of a portfolio type book of it, um, half story, half you know, uh, just the photos, and then uh, and then once. Once uh, the the recounts and everything like that are done with the election, um, I'll actually put together kind of a finished like 15 minute film uh, using the videos and 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 uh, and some of my investigations from the election. So, okay, mm -hmm. cool. And we missed each other in Florida. What happened there? I, I got uh, we got snowed in for three days straight. Um, so when I finally got in, uh, I, <laughs> it was. It was already like basically I flew in the day before Thanksgiving, um, and then that was it. So, all right. Yeah. Well, we'll have to do an, we'll have to do a little live show again some other time. Maybe we'll have you up in uh, down in Biloxi sometime. Yeah, we we'll do a show then. Cool. All right, great. We're well, glad to have you back. Uh, I want to talk all about our topics this evening. Uh, Jeff, I want to definitely talk to you about your your Tank Man photo and its uh, appearance in the top 100 most influential photos. We are going to get to that soon. Uh, but let's talk about, let's get on the show and, and let's talk about our first topic this evening. Uh, the, the TV show, or I guess you saw the web series, uh, Top Photographer, that was done by Adorama TV, recently concluded its season and they announced their top photographer, uh, whose name escapes me at the moment. But I did watch the episode, I watched the uh, the finale. Um, and I'm going to find out, if, I'm going to remind myself who exactly the, the winner was. But in the meantime, um, guys, why don't you and tell me what your thoughts were on this show? Do you think it did anything to elevate our craft? Do you like these kind of live, uh, or not live, but do you kind of like these reality sort of shows about our career field? Better let Ron answer that one. I haven't seen that. Did, did you watch it, Zach? I I've only I only watched it at the beginning. Um, I mean, I like what they were doing, and and I like any time it kind of brings, you know, any anything that brings uh, you know photographers to a little bit more. Than kind of the usual, you know, 
you know, anytime photographers are usually seen on film or, or television, they're, they're getting arrested, they're sneaking over somebody's fence, and they're bad guys usually. So anytime that, you know, <laughs> um, they're like serial murderers, they're like everything under the sun if they, you know, ever watch Law and Order or something like that. So anytime you can actually have photographers that aren't like, portray that are portrayed on TV in, in real life or not, um, that are good guys, I, I kind of like that. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. I, I saw the whole series. I watched it from the beginning. I caught in, I think, episode four. I didn't watch up to four. And I think there was six episodes, I think. So I caught the other two as they came up. And um, uh, watching the show itself, I, I, I wanted to identify with one of the photographers as to which one of these guys is me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, judging by what they're shooting. And I would have got washed out right away because I was one of the <laughs> – I picked one of the first guys. Oh, I'm more like this guy. He got washed right out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, but but uh, even though Jeff didn't watch the show, um, I'm sure you've had experience with uh, contests of uh, photographic nature or. Uh... Yeah. Well, my my excuse is the fact that I'm living in Germany, so I've been kind of isolated away for a lot of the TV shows, um, and I just you know I just got back here, so I'm really not caught up in a lot of that. But uh, regarding contests, um, where would you like to start on that? Where would you like to go? Your experience with uh, well, I, I mean, you must have entered, entered the contest or two. Yeah, I was uh, very heavy into the contest thing um, uh, back as when a I judge was or a Sorry, as a judge or a contestant, both. Uh, you know, in the early days, uh, the contests were extremely important to help you along in your career, and uh, you know, when you're you know, you had a resume and you would list all these different competitions on there. Um, I was a member of the National Press Photographers Association, and I would enter the monthly click contest. Uh, I came in first runner-up photographer of the year in Region 6. Uh, I came in third place in Region 10 at one time. Came very close to winning uh, photographer of the year, but uh, just missed out. But I was very competitive. I I, I've been a little bit uh, busy with other things lately, but I still enjoy entering the competitions like Pictures of the Year in Missouri and best of photojournalism, world press. And I think it's important for, even today, I think for photographers starting out, it's, uh, it's important to uh, be competitive and enter the photo competitions. And it's a good chance to compare yourself with other photographers' work, get feedback from the judges. And, and so I think that's an important element for uh, especially uh, young folks starting out uh, in their careers. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned by the contestants is you know, that they grew during the contest. And I think that's true of any time when you're in a situation where you're getting like critique, <clears throat> not only by critique, but obviously critique by people who are you know, very well known in the industry. And now I think about, it, I'm not going to reveal who the winner is because if you haven't watched the show, I'm going to ruin the surprise for you. So I'm not going to tell you who the one. I will say that I was surprised by the winner because the way they made it sound, it was going one way. Anyways, you, you watch it, you let me know. Um, although I honestly, I saw the show, I wasn't very impressed with the, the winner's works. It just, I don't know. It was all like everything was like fashion and landscape and like moment, you know, everything was models and stuff. And I just, eh. you know, as a visual journalist, I, I didn't see the whole series. Uh, Ron, did they do any like news or photojournalism at all? Or is it all just kind uh, of like it wasn't fashion? Like that. It was more um, landscapes, um, art, art kind of stuff, yeah. models, uh, fashion, like that. Right. It, it kind of reminds me, like, just looking at the portfolios, and it basically looks like, uh, you know, uh, America's top Instagram photographer. <laughs> Unless, not to insult it, that's a platform. I'm not insulting it. It's just that style and look that, like, the photos that get, you know, very popular on Instagram are basically what all of these photographers do. Um, and, you know, whether or not they're and, – and that's fine. Just obviously not my cup of tea, not, that, not the kind of work that I want to do. So – yeah. yeah, again, I wasn't... I wasn't on Instagram. I love it. What was that? I just got on Instagram. I love it. <laughs> I know you're growing. A, uh, how long have you been on Instagram so far? I think I've been on five weeks, and I'm up to 440 followers. That's awesome. Nice. That's you already passed me. <laughs> yeah, you're probably going to surpass this doll here pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. With your legacy, you know, it won't be too long before people... Uh, yeah. Start latching on to your uh, Instagram. You know, you mentioned you were also a judge. What would you say is the what's it like? What was it like being a judge versus being a contestant? And and just how did you go about judging? 
Well, I, I haven't judged that many photo competitions, but I remember one uh, particularly. When I was 17, I won the Kodak Scholastic National Photography Scholarship. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, hey, that, that was a great one. I got a trip to Africa. Oh, wow. I beat out 8,000 students from across the U.S. But the cool thing about it was 10 years later, uh, they invited me to be the judge of the contest I'd won. That's awesome. And so uh, it was very interesting to see uh, what was being presented. And I was with Jay Silverman, who was a pretty well-known uh, commercial photographer in Los Angeles. He was uh, also uh, one of the students at Reseda High School, where I went, under Warren King, who was a great uh, teacher. He just uh, passed away recently at 90-something. He was a World War II photographer. But that contest was really great. And the thing about it was, out of all those uh, pictures that we judged, there was this one guy, it was all black and white. And I think there was, uh, I think there was a couple of colors. But we moved it to the side, and it got buried under a pile of photographs from all across the country. And we got down to the final judging, and I talked to Jay, and I said, Jay, guy that had some great street photography, and he goes, yeah, but it's in a huge pile. And then we looked at each other like, we, do we really want to deal with this? And it says, yeah, we, we got to. So we went through the pile, and he ended up winning the whole thing. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you for being, uh, you know, diligent. Yeah. And you're judging. That's good. Giving the guy uh, well, the, the share. I told him what happened because he, I'm sure he would have enjoyed uh, knowing that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he just know, you know, enjoyed knowing that, you know, Jeff Widener had reviewed his work and uh, deemed him the, the winner of the contest. Um, so do you think these type of reality shows, I mean, you said, I think, I think you mentioned it, Ron, you know, that they shine light on at least our career field and in Zach, they... Oh, that was, uh, that, that was Zach's okay. point. Zach, so, so you, you think that they're ultimately good for our industry? I mean, I think so. I mean, any, you know, I mean, obviously you end up having that problem where then you have this influx of the more uh, any field gets, especially field in art gets popular or visual media or whatever uh, gets popular. You have this huge influx of people, but then you also have a whole bunch of new people that are, that are looking at it and more people that are appreciating the field in general. Um, you know, I mean, like it'd be interesting to do a reality show with uh like combat photographers or something like that, <laughs> yeah. which, you know, I mean, uh, what was it? The a show I talk about quite often witnessed it quite well, where they followed around a handful of combat photographers uh, oh. kind of doing their work. Um, and uh, Eros Hoagland was the f uh, first person featured on that show. We, we had as a guest earlier, uh, earlier in the show. Um, and uh that that alone would be interesting. I don't know how you'd whittle down the uh, the, mem the the people though. <laughs> but they drop off. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they give up and you know they realize they can't can't pay for their life. <laughs> like oh my camera broke. I uh, got shot with a you know an a uh, AR-15. I guess this is over. <laughs> yeah, simply you know whoever survives is the winner. That's that's pretty much how I would see it. Wow, that's um, dark. <laughs> It's Hunger I, I Games there. Photography I Edition. <laughs> I went there, Zach. Hey, it is combat photography. Let me tell you. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I thought the I thought I think the show is good. I mean, I know there's been other competition shows. Again, I wasn't really paying attention to this show until it was brought up as a topic for conversation. But upon watching at least the last episode, I thought it was good. Uh, again, I wasn't too impressed by the photographers overall, but I do like seeing the stuff. I would be interested to see if there was one that was more focused on news photography or photojournalism or you know even filmmaking you know i think would be interesting at least for my uh taste but i do uh, i do think it's good that you know people like adoram are taking chances on stuff like this and it is ultimately just a photo contest televised so you know i think that's pretty good um do you uh do you enter competitions nowadays uh, either anybody enter competitions nowadays or is it basically something you did when you were younger well anyway. i still i still uh, try to so jeff you still you still try to is that uh interesting when yeah, people like yeah, see I photographs mean, yeah. like i don't know because it's probably anonymous but does he ever like submit it to a contest and like the, the judge doesn't realize they're reviewing or they're judging work by Jeff Widener? You know, I got to be honest with you. Um, I believe that if you're serious into the contest thing, there are certain photographers that are doing well, they're being seen a bit, 
And I think the judges pretty much have a general idea who they are because they've previously seen the photographs. Yeah. Definitely, I think, is some favoritism that goes on. I mean, it's to be expected to a certain degree. Right. And, um, and I think that um, there could be biases, but it's the way it is with anything in life. You know, it's uh, uh, something you just have to deal with. But uh, there's always the flavor of the month. And, and uh, there's, of course, there's been favorites in the 90s, you know, in the 80s. And uh, I know that, like David and Peter Turnley, them, you know, and, and whenever those guys rolled into town, everybody was looking to see where they were going because they were always on the ball and always on the right news event. Yep. And uh, I used to, time, but, you know, and everybody, a lot of people would know their work. Uh, there's been other great photographers and you get a general idea. I've been a judge and I, I mean, I can look at a bunch of pictures and get a general idea from the style, who the photographer is. And so uh, it can go either way. You can have a bias or it could be a favorite, a favoritism thing. But, but I like the competitions. Uh, it's, it's always fun to win. Um, I think the last thing I won was uh, in the Southern Short Course, by a picture I took with a Leica in London of a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, building cranes and then there were jet trails so they were all mixing in different directions and it was, it was obviously in film it was black and white it might have been a symphony vote <laughs> i don't know but anyway it was fun i got uh, that as a an award but uh, sure i try i mean it's fun i always try to enter do you feel that like at your level and uh you know your level of success do you think that perhaps you have an unfair advantage over other people entering the contest or do you think it's always just sort of a Everybody's on no. the same level. No, I don't think so. Um, I think that there. Look, the judging happens so fast. It's literally like next, next, next. They put it aside. Next, next. And I and I've seen them go right through my work. And the best I got on one competition was they held on to it for an agonizing ten or fifteen seconds, and then it was <laughs> right. next. I don't, it has nothing to do with me unless they've seen it or they know the picture. But it's so uh, unique. And, uh, of course, my style is kind of retro, so a lot of the new uh, judges may not recognize it. I mean, I really don't know, but there's certainly no advantage to me. And there's a lot of great young photographers out there that uh, are doing things that are incredible. So, no, I don't think there's any special uh, – uh, I mean, I think that if I were to pick up an award, they would just be applauding that I'm still standing. I still have hair, yeah, so yeah. I think that's something right there that I would get some applause for. Great, yeah. No, we have a, a contest in the military called the Defense Information School's Military Photographer of the Year, and they uh, uh, publish the judging live while they do it. And so when I used to uh, compete for that back when I was enlisted, I would, um, you know, watch the judging, and then if they uh, went over a photograph that was mine, and they said yes to go to like the next round. I'd be like, oh my God, I won. I didn't really win, but I got to the next round because so many excellent entries would just get dropped off in the first round and stuff you thought, oh man, that's a beautiful photograph, but nope, not God. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really a level playing field. And you know, like I said, you could lose and you could win. It's you know, really at the behest of the judging and you know, the quality of the work. So, all right, great. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next topic this evening. We're going to talk all about you, Jeff, in a sense. Well, we're not talking about you directly. We're talking about uh, the top 100 photographs. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last week, but since obviously we have you here and you know your photograph tank man was selected for this, you know we have a unique opportunity to talk to someone you know, because so many of the the photographers uh, who are featured in the um, you know, the 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 collection are no longer with us. But obviously we've got a few living legends who are you know still out there, still producing work, and you know we can talk to them. So I want to talk to you uh, first of all. How does it feel to have you know your photograph selected for this uh, prestigious sort of um, collection, and then talk a little bit about sort of how you got the photograph? Um, well, I got the invitation from Time Magazine. Uh, they had interviewed me two years earlier, and I forgot that they shot video of me, so I was a little bit surprised when I got the invitation. But um, I was really honored uh, to uh, have been included in the book. And I flew out to uh, the book launching. Uh, I, I really haven't seen the book yet. I've just seen a couple of pages because everything in the last couple of weeks has been going crazy. But um, I, I did see James Notchway in there and uh, 
and I know that uh, they're, they're pretty much all the great photographers that I've known in, in my career are in there. Um, it was a, a fantastic to, uh, at the very end, be hanging out with Harry Benson and uh, Ron Gagella, who shot all those Jackie uh, Kennedy photographs, and Richard Drew, uh, who shot Falling Man. And so, you know, we're all hanging out. Getty was, was there taking our pictures. And it was just like, I felt like, you know, a young football player, you know, and then all of a sudden he's in the pros and there's Joe Namath or something, you know, he's, and it's my God, he's with, you know, these great other, you know, photog I mean, uh, football players. So that was a pretty, uh, pretty uh, crazy feeling. That it was really wonderful, actually. So, um, but uh, as far as my career, where did you want to go with that? Or did you want to discuss? Uh, well, before we, what part, before we what chapter to go, there's lots of them. I know, right? Before we jump into that, I just want to, touch on something you said, you know, you mentioned you're with all these other sort of titans of the industry, so to speak. And it's just like, you know, you are just as I would say, um, starstruck as anyone else would be, you know, surrounded by, you know, these people, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you got to understand that this is a lucky photo. I was in the wrong place at the right time. And, um, it's like a lottery shoot. Um, it just so I, I still remember as a kid, uh, I was about 12 years old, I was looking at, uh, I think it was a Time Life book, and they had these iconic photos, and there was the Hindenburg crash, and there was uh, a picture in uh, the Napalm Girl, and uh, Eddie Adams' picture of uh, the guy getting shot, and then all these great images, I, would lo I was looking at this, and I was, in, I was in my bedroom, I remember looking at it, and I got this strange feeling, like, I wonder if I will ever have a photo like that. And then years and years later, I was at home and AOL came on and, uh, you know, you have mail. And I was looking through my mail and all of a sudden I saw this headline, top 10 most memorable photos of all time. And I don't think it, the picture really stuck in my mind how important it was until I saw that link. And I was looking through the pictures and they're the same photographs, the Hindenburg crash, there was Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And then this flash of color came up and it was my tank picture. And I got to tell you, I get the creepiest sensation up my spine <laughs> to imagine, and that's when it sunk in that, my God, I really pulled it off. I did something really incredible. And, and, and sometimes even today, it's hard to believe that, I, I mean, because I almost screwed the picture up totally. It up. And uh, if you want to talk about that, I can do it. But I'm telling you, I almost botched it. And it's a miracle. Every time I look at that picture, I, I, I get a, uh, I really get a chill because um, I, every time I look at it, it reminds me I almost lost it. I do want to talk about how, you know, the, actually the back behind the story, but, you know, I just want to finally say, like, you know, does, does the recognition, you know, has it done anything uh, for you or, so to speak, has it, you know, um, have been more people been reaching out to you than normal or have, uh, you know, has it, has it personally for you sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say validated, but sort of um, made you feel like, you know, you are, you know, sort of, uh, I want to say etched your place in history, so to speak, or like, I, I'm not trying to sound grandiose, but I mean, maybe you don't think about it like that, but I'm just wondering if, if that has, you know, anything like that sort of thoughts have come to you. Well, I've had a very colorful career and uh, there's been a lot of highs and lows. Uh, when I was a kid, I was a bit of a Charlie Brown. I was always a kid to drop the ball and I was getting help from the rest of the team. So when I finally realized that I could do something fairly well with photography, I kind of really grasped onto that. So for a guy who was a little bit insecure uh, and to get a photo like that, it certainly gave me a boost in confidence. And um, I would say that it has, it's had a huge impact in my life. There have been a lot of people reach out. The picture seems to be growing in stature. I mean, I, I thought that it would actually be dying out because I mean, the, as younger people grow up, you know, they kind of forget about the past like that. But what I found is it's actually growing in fact, I just got contacted uh, a couple of weeks ago from an eighth grader back east who's doing a world history project and she wanted to interview me. So they really are teaching this about this photograph and what's happened in China in the schools. And, and, and uh, like I went, I spoke to a high university and there's about 400 students there. And afterwards, they're all coming up to me taking selfies and I feel like Elvis Presley, you know? And, and so <laughs> it seems to have, um, uh, it, there's a passion for this photograph. and. Nobody knows where Tank Man is, so where are you going to go? You're going to go, the next guy I saw him last, and that's me. And so 
uh, I'm in this position where it's great. I love the attention. But on the other side of me as the artist, I'm still pushing very hard to get my other work out there so people realize that I did do other things. And that's one of the reasons I just redid my website. I've just joined Instagram. I want folks out there to see, hey, you know, I did do other things. And um, so I'm kind of pushing a little bit in that direction now and, and trying to put the tank man a little bit aside. Uh, so that's, uh, and as I said before, um, one of the coolest things that happened to me was on the 20th anniversary, the BBC invited me to do a documentary in Beijing. And as I was walking down the street, I saw this young woman and chatted her up. The next thing I know, I married the next year and I've been living happily married with Corinna for six years in Hamburg, Germany. And so uh, that's probably one of the most influential uh, things that's happened to me from the Tank Man photos. So I'm... Yeah. Uh, so you don't want to be just, like I, sort of the, the, the Mark Hamill of Star Wars, you know, <laughs> But speaking of that, okay, let's talk about let's talk about the Thank Man photo. Uh, tell us about how that was, that was that kind of came to be. And oh we'll man, uh, there's a long version and a short version. I'll give you the short version. Basically, um, all this um, activity in Tiananmen with the protesters was happening, and I'd been monitoring it from uh, Bangkok because I was the Southeast Asia picture editor. Now that was up in the north, and that was covered out of the Tokyo bureau building and sooner or later AP was going to bring me in on that. So I went to the uh, Chinese embassy and applied for a visa. They turned me down and of course that didn't stop me. Uh, I uh, went to Hong Kong and got a, I told the American embassy I lost my passport because I had previous Chinese stamps. I, I, they gave me a dirty look because apparently about 50, 100 journalists have been going saying they lost their passport and um, I finally got a tourist visa. Now, AP wanted me to bring every, every kind of possible piece of gear you can imagine in, a 600 millimeter lens, transmitters, and I'm on a tourist visa. So I'm pushing this cart that looks like it's coming from B&H Photo with all this gear, and these steely-eyed customs guys are just looking like they're going to pummel your kidneys in. And just as I get right up to the guy, I'm, like, I'm literally trembling. This squawking's going on way down at the end of the counters. And there's, a, there's an old lady, and feathers are flying everywhere, and the security guys are running over, and my guy left, and I just pushed the cart right through the doors now to the taxis. So that's how I got into the country. Yeah. Um, nice. Now, I was there the night it happened, and it, it, there's a lot more I could say, but basically in a nutshell, I was running low on batteries, I was running low on film, and I'd already gotten pictures uh, protesters and they were taking over uh, armored cars and I was running out of film and, and I thought okay I've got some great pictures I better get back to the AP office on the way back there's a burning armored car and I had been running in terror because I thought I was gonna get shot by one of these armored cars and I reached for uh, one of my lenses and it was gone so the only thing that left me was a wide-angle zoom and this armored car on fire is coming towards me and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, the only way I get this picture is if I get right in front of it and very close. So I sort of did a tank man myself and I thought I was going to get shot because if a flash goes off, they might think it's gunfire because some of these protesters had confiscated AK-47s. I don't know how I did it, but I took the picture and I'm looking down and waiting and waiting and waiting for the recycle light. It took, it took 60 seconds. Now, can you imagine one of the biggest stories of the 20 years and you can only take a picture every 60 seconds while people are running around throwing rocks screaming gunfire way in the distance so i literally think it's a cruel joke from robert kapler so they're looking down laughing at me uh, and so I, I waited and i pulled it up to my face and just as i pulled up the camera bam this big rock smashed into my face shattered it was a nikon titanium Ripped the, uh, Nikon, the uh, Vivitar 283 flash off the top, ripped the top off, ripped the lens off, smashed the mirror, and bent the titanium shutter curtain. And I was totally knocked silly. And then the burning armor car door opened up. A soldier came out to surrender. The crowd looked at him. And then they went in and just beat, beat him to death, I think. I mean, there's another dead soldier on the side. So... I was attacked for a while and I managed to talk my way out of it, held American passport over my head. 
I got back to the office. I was bleeding. I had no idea how bad my injuries were. Mark Avery was the AP photo chief back out to killing people. And I said, no kidding, you know what I mean? And so he had to take my camera and pry the film open in the darkroom to, to get that film out. Oh, now, after all that happened, I went back to my hotel and uh, I was exhausted, injured, scared to death. And basically I chickened out. I just, I could not find the inner energy to go back out. And I was, I was um, actually, I was, I was really, um, how can I say this? I was embarrassed. I felt like a coward. But I think looking back, it probably saved my life. Now, here I am back in the Jingwa Hotel. I turn on the TV. I order a cheeseburger from room service. And there's all these flames on CNN coming right down the street where I just was. So to say I was feeling guilty is putting it mildly. But I, I was really seriously injured. Now, the next day I walked in, I was literally a nervous wreck. And when I walked into the AP office, there's this message. I'll never forget it. Uh, we don't want anyone to make any unnecessary risk, but if somebody could please photograph the occupied Tiananmen Square, we'd appreciate it. Well, that was me. I was the lucky guy again. And so I had to take my bicycle all the way down to the Beijing Hotel, which is like two miles away. And I had to sneak in with all this gear inside of a, you know, my jacket. And they had these security guys that use cattle prods to, to basically fry the journalists so they don't give up their, their gear. And I met this kid named uh, Kurt, and... He was an American student exchange service, and I asked him if he could let me up to his room, and he did. Now, he's instrumental in the photo because I ran out of film, and I asked him if he could get some more. He came back two hours later with one roll of 100 ASA Fujifilm, one roll, and uh, I usually normally shoot 800. And this made a big difference because when the tank man came down the street, I'm on, I have a Nikon FE2 camera with an automatic meter. Well, I look at light, I know what it is. I don't need to look at a meter. I say, okay, it's 250 approximately at F11 with a 400 millimeter lens and a doubler. And I'm taking one, two, three, and I look at the meter and it's about 30th of a second at 800 millimeter lens. And I'm just, well, you know, what's happening, you know, and boom, it's over. The guy is swept away by some people on the street. I come back and sit down against the window and, and Kirk comes up to me and says, did you get the photo? Did you get the photo? And I just said, no, I don't think so, man. I, I think I blew it. But he said, I asked him a big favor. Can you s smuggle this film in your underwear back to the AP office? And he agreed. And he really did something very courageous. I couldn't go back out because I, I, if I got, if I got uh, chosen, uh, they stopped me, then I would have never been able to get back in the room and, and, and do any more reportage. So he took a risk, and five hours later, he came back and said he couldn't find where the AP office was, but he gave it to the American Embassy, and thank God the American Embassy passed it on over to the AP office. And when I finally came back the next day, there was a clipboard. You talk about uh, feeling some adoration and an a, 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 you know, ego boost. There was a clipboard with messages from all around the world congratulating me. Uh, Horace Foz is a famous legendary war photographer in the Vietnam War was a bureau editor. And he said, uh, Widener, you're, you're fronting all front London papers half page. And uh, newspaper Liberation wanted an exclusive interview. Time Magazine uh, was asking about it. Life Magazine uh, made a double truck spread with it. It was like unbelievable. And so um, that's the story in a nutshell. There's uh, been a lot left out, but hopefully it'll give you an idea of what happened. Yeah, no, definitely. And then, um yeah, you know, obviously you got that initial uh, feedback and response, but what was it like in the, the subsequent, you know, when you came back and, and whatnot, um, you know, how did that well, change over? you got to remember, well, one thing I forgot to mention, I had, a, I was very ill, okay? I had a flu that was horrible, and um, I, my, I had a swollen throat, and I was just, uh, I was just very sick, plus I had this massive head injury, so I was totally spaced out. Nothing seemed like reality. And uh, in fact, when I, when I took the photo of Tank Man, it didn't seem unusual that some guy would walk out in front of a bunch of tanks. It just seemed like normal for the, you know, normal for the day. But I was really not totally with it. And the first time I realized that something might have happened 
was when uh, David Turnley came up to me and said, Jeff, I think you're going to win the Pulitzer Prize. And then when, when he told me that, it's like, are, are you kidding me? You know, like, and then, and then so then it started clicking a little bit. Maybe I, maybe I had something better than I thought. And, uh, and then after that, it was like, it was just an, everybody was coming on to me, ask, you know, congratulating me. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, that was one of the hottest years I had. I was being invited to speak everywhere. I was being interviewed by everybody. And um, it's just, it was a phenomenal experience that uh, continues today. In fact, on the 25th anniversary, I was in Hong Kong. You would not believe it, what it was like. They, they had an exhibit of my other photographs. And I had a friend who was like an air traffic controller. I had the BBC calling. I had CNN calling. Voice of America was begging and pleading to, just for five minutes. Uh, I was on, I mean, Effie, Spanish News Agency, AP, you name it, I was on it. And I was on the Charlie Rose Show for 18 minutes, and that's on my website. So, and it was an unbelievable honor to meet that guy. So, it's just, it keeps growing. This, I mean, I'm on your show, okay? Everybody, everybody <laughs> wants to talk. I make a lot of sense. It's this great. This is the bar. Yeah, <laughs> no. I'm in Hawaii. I'm, I'm it's a happy. nice day out. I got a, I got friends here, so you know, I'm happy to be here. You know, you mentioned the Pulitzer, and I was just looking up. You didn't win the Pulitzer that year, but you were a finalist. Were you disappointed you didn't win? What What did you think oh, of the God, actual yeah. winner that year? I was crushed. I, I, my biggest dream was to win a Pulitzer since I was 12, and uh, I remember that um, I had a uh, my photo boss, Jim Palmer. He was out of Tokyo. And uh, he just happened to be in Bangkok around that time. And Neil Yulovich, who won a Pulitzer in Bangkok, just happened to be down there in Bangkok around that time. And I think, I think we all knew that uh, I had a pretty good chance at winning it. So the, um, I remember the night it was going to be announced. And it was going to be announced probably 4 a.m. my time, Bangkok. So I was waiting and waiting. And when 5 o'clock rolled around, I just knew I lost. And I was just devastated. And I walked into the office. And nobody said anything. And I went to the computer and I typed Pulitzer. I want to see who won. And nothing came up. And I walked around and I just kind of casually asked somebody, uh, so what happened with the Pulitzers? And they said, oh, they, they haven't picked it yet. And I said, oh, my God, thank God. And so I just, at that point, I didn't want to know when it was going to be announced. I didn't want to know. The next day I came in. And again, nobody said anything. So I figured they didn't announce it. And I went to the computer and I typed P for Pulitzer, and I just got the first pull, and then it, it flashed. And the second it flashed, I knew I lost. And at the same time, a hand came down on my shoulder, and it was Jim Palmer, and he said, sorry, buddy. I'm sorry to, you, know, sorry you didn't get it. And then let's go to lunch. So I went to lunch when Neil came there, and we started ordering some dim sum. And we, I started immediately looking for wine or anything to get drunk. And um, I remember that... Um, um, you know, uh, Jim was just saying, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. And uh, Yulowich was saying, yeah, you know, it's not such a big deal to have a Pulitzer. I said, yeah, you got one. It's easy to say that. <laughs> so basically, uh, I, pretty got, I, I, mean, I pretty much got wasted. I came back to the office. I went to the computer just to see who won. And there's Dave Eternally, uh, which is pretty funny considering he was the one telling me I was going to win. And then... I saw a Pulitzer finalist, and I said, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, they, get, they get a finalist? Oh, but that's right. They get a finals category. I said, hey, Jim, they have a finals category. And he said, no, they don't. No, they don't. I said, no, no, I think I saw something during an air show. That guy got a finalist. I said, no, they don't have it. All of a sudden, Jeff Widener, finalist. I said, hey, Jim, I was a finalist. <laughs> so, you know, that was pretty anticlimactic, but still, I'm very happy to be an almost but no cigar on the Pulitzer side. Hey, you know what? I think there'd be uh... – most of us would dream to at least be a finalist in that competition. So, you know, that's definitely oh, I'm a... I'm, I'm very happy about that, trust me. <laughs> no, absolutely. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about what it was like to shoot an assignment back then with your sort of older cameras and whatnot. What is it like for you to shoot assignment, you know, nowadays? What's like the largest, you know, the most recent big assignment where you've been at and, and what was, how did it compare? The recent big assignment I had was a friend's birthday party. And uh, I hadn't done much shooting for a while because I've literally been going through my archives for the last couple of years. It is a major, major endeavor. Um, and uh, 
I've been distracted just from Europe. Europe is a great place to hang out. And so I've kind of been in semi-retirement mode. But the last big assignment, I think, was in Angola. I got a job working for an NGO. I got, uh, I knew I was going to get sick. I've been to Africa before. So I hit the ground running, and I shot as much stuff as I could before I got sick. And sure enough, like clockwork, I got deathly ill. Um, I brought my wife with me uh, because I always try to bring her on uh, trips with me. And she really saved me uh, down there. But I managed to get quite a few good pictures, and they're on my website, and uh, there's an Angola section. But uh, I think for the two-week period that I was down there, I got some pretty nice uh, images. And I hope to get seriously more back into shooting. I'm now looking to get some more uh, updated uh, camera equipment. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of different things right now. And uh, I just turned 60, so. Congratulations. Ron and I are discussing these possibilities. <laughs> Well, happy birthday. Uh, what are you shooting with nowadays? Uh, well, I've got a lot of Nikon glass, um, like a 400-2.8 VR2, 200 F2. Um, you know, I've got two D700s, which are I've got some mileage on them now. I've got to get some upgrades. I've gone back to shooting Leica M7s and shooting Tri-X film. I absolutely love the look uh, and, uh, and the shooting mode that that forces you into. Uh, it's, a, it's, the, it, it's the classic period that I grew up in, of Robert Frank and Gary Winogrand, and, and it's just, I love that classic period in photo history. So I've been focusing a lot on that, and I, and I actually have a book on Hawaii that I started in 2006, sort of hidden Hawaii, that I've now finished, and I'm going to try to package this up to present to publishers, and I, I think it's a really cool project, and, I, and some of those images are on my website. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about that as well. Is there a topic or a focus or a, a subject matter that you still want to capture or that you, you know, uh, that you haven't had a chance to really focus in on as a photographer, as a photojournalist that you, you'd like to spend time on? I always thought it'd be cool to fly around the Air Force One. Um, that's one thing I, I've never accomplished. I've already been to the South Pole. I would love to go to the North Pole. Um, I've, uh, there's... Um, I thought about doing some photo essays, get some grants. I'd love to do a book on America. I'd love to, I thought about doing a, a project on Zydeco, uh, swamp music in Louisiana, and, and you know, do that as a project with music. And I'm probably giving my whole idea away now, so somebody else is going to do, do it. But <laughs> these are the kind of things that I would love to do. Um, and I just, uh, there's, there's, I've got all kinds of ideas. The problem is, you get distracted in life, as you know, and I don't have a regular job like I used to. I've been mostly freelancing. And when you have a lot of time in your head, you have plenty of time to just kind of loaf off and get distracted. So uh, that's where I'm at right now. I'm doing interviews in Honolulu. I'm distracted. I could be out there doing a great project, but I'm here. So well, you're inside when there's a beautiful beach and beautiful outside out there. So uh, we thank you. Speaking of beach. I just I just posted a beach picture today on Instagram. Oh my I think you'll like Everybody, it. go check that out. Go follow uh, Jeff Widener and get all his beach photos. Um, you mentioned <laughs> your career, and um, I lost my train of thought. Ron, save me. Ron, what do you think of, what do you uh, think of Jeff? Sorry, He's already saved me. Okay, so. the future <laughs> projects you asked him about, and he yeah. said he wished he could um, Zydeco and Air Force One. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you should become a pool photographer for Trump. I'm sure you're gonna impress uh, Air Force One that Sorry? way. Become a pool Sorry? photographer for become a pool photographer for uh, Donald Trump for you know, covering him. I'm sure that get you. Know, you know what? One. I would love that. I would. I would love to. He's a fascinating man, and uh, I think it would be incredible to be his photographer and follow him around and see what he's going to actually do to America. Um, I'm, some people might disagree, but. Give the guy a chance, you know. I mean, this guy just got settled in. You know, he, he might make some positive changes. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, have you been back to uh, China or the place where you shot the Tank Man photo, like that hotel or that area or that, you know, have you been that since you left? Uh, yes, I've been back. Did so, you ever go back and revisit it? Like yeah, I've been back several times. Um, the uh, one thing I notice is that when you're leaving the country, the, the, it takes about literally 30 seconds for the person in front of you to get through. 
But for some reason, it takes them about 20 minutes before they let me leave. So I don't know if they're trying to decide if they want to lock me up or, or, or what. <laughs> it's, it's, it always takes 20 minutes or so for me to get out of the country. Oh my gosh. You're on a list. <laughs> Zach, any thoughts on you? Good boy uh, when I'm over there, so. Any thoughts uh, from you on, you know, what do you want to talk? What do you want to ask Jeff Widener, man? Shut that, the thing, it's, man. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you shoot a lot of protests yourself, so, I mean, how do you – First, I got to say, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating because uh, uh, two years ago, I was doing a, uh, a shoot for Al Jazeera, and we were in the office of this uh, Republican, um, uh, a conservative, it wasn't Republican, but it was a conservative um, person who claimed that there was, uh, you know, thousands of people illegally on voter rolls. I work a lot in voter suppression, sorry. And he had a massive um, blow up of Tank Man uh, over his desk. And he, he identified with uh, the man standing in front of the tank. And we actually did, like, there was like a five-minute portion of the interview uh, where we were talking to him about the photo um, and about how he identified as the person up against the tanks and everything like that. And, of course, we're outing him as, as a person who is basically trying to throw people off of the voter rolls and everything like that. So it's, it's interesting how far and how reach and how certain photos that you think you know, are maybe one have, you know, people are going to view it from one side that anybody, it's like art in general, like anyone looks at a photo, looks at a painting and sees it, you know, the way they want to. So, but, um, you know, it's, it's funny that, that that picture, there's been so many cartoons made of, yeah. that, of that photo. There's, there's been artworks, there's been music. Um, I just saw a cartoon with Donald Trump standing in front of the four tanks. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's literally been everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's incredible that uh, it still keeps giving, sort of. I mean, it's amazing. And um, I still can't believe it's my picture. So it's, it's, it's really strange, actually. <laughs> what, well, what I think, do you, you know, to think about this? I'm sorry, go ahead, Zach. So what, what do you think, you know, about the difference? What do you think has changed in, say, you know, not necessarily combat where it's like a direct war, but like in the kind of protest photography uh, over the years. Like since you had to shoot film and you talk about like the ridiculous like process at which you had to go from film to actually being in a newspaper. And nowadays, you know, I mean, for me, I just need my phone and upload. And, you know, oh. how do you think that's changed the way we see things? Oh, it is. You cannot believe uh, how much it's changed. When I got to uh, AP... Well, first of all, you know how everybody gets the first day of the job and it's kind of awkward? The first day of the job, I get a telex from Boris Foz in London saying that uh, he wants me in Jaffna, northern Sri Lanka, graphs of the fighting between the Indian troop, peacekeeper troops, and the Sinhalese, I mean, uh, the Tamil guerrillas. So okay. literally the first day on the job, I'm on an airplane to the first time, uh, to a war zone. My first war, the first day <laughs> that I started work, yeah. I hadn't even checked out of a hotel in Bangkok, and I'm, in a, I'm a stuck I'm in a bunker getting shot at by Tamil guerrillas. So to get those pictures out, uh, it's, it's, and sometimes in those days it was virtually impossible. Normally what I would do, the first thing you do is you get a good taxi driver because he's your translator, he's your transportation, um, he's, he's your bodyguard. He's, he's, um, you know, your go for, he's everything that is, it, you want a damn good taxi driver and you want a two way radio, not a cell phone, but you want at least a radio. You can communicate with him and call for help if you need him. Yeah. Um, so I would move into a hotel, the best hotel that doesn't have rats. <laughs> Make sure you have a lot of bug spray, a lot of mosquito netting. I have a phobia against insects. I hate insects. So they got cockroaches the size of tennis shoes there, and I always made sure that I had needle to sew up the, the you know, the mosquito nets. <laughs> then what I would do is tear, tear the, first thing is to tear the whole, uh, the hotel room apart, move the bed over, move the desk over to make an office, set up the hair dryers, uh, set up the dark room with a larger in the bathroom. I mean, and, 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 and then pray that there's no cockroaches attacking you at night. So I'd, I'd be covering a war zone or something, and then I'd come back and I'd start processing. And then that's just the fun part. I sent the <laughs> photograph back to New York and it would take five, six, seven hours and maybe a couple thousand dollars to send one photograph. Yeah. Um, 
could be photographing for 12, 13 minutes, and all of a sudden the operator comes on and says, sir, are you finished with the call? And there's this big line going through your photo, and you got to restart the thing. So I learned a lot of tricks on how to get clean photos through by booking the call, trying to get the best lines directly through Paris or, you know, a satellite link. You know, you have to ask for this stuff. You have to bribe a lot. You know, a lot of things are involved that now you just go and uh, you go to Hanoi and you check into the room. It's air-conditioned. You order room service. you got a, a satellite phone that you can, I mean, it's all so easy. Yeah. They don't have electricity back in those days. I'd be riding in a cyclo. It's, I don't even know how the drivers could see. So I used to flash my light just to see, and I, I see bodies everywhere, just bodies sleeping all over the streets in Hanoi. And I don't know how the driver swerves around these guys in the dark. They're like cats. It was amazing. So those were the kind of times when I was there. And so they have dramatically changed now. It's, it's a, a whole different ballgame. Yeah. I mean, it was really romantic back there. I kind of wish it stayed I mean, does it amaze you how technology has changed to the point where it's just so easy to do anything, really, with regard to, you know, transmitting imagery or video? It just blows my mind. I mean, it's um, I remember as a kid, I was watching the uh, Apollo landing, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I had my own computer in my room <laughs> where I could ask it any question about the world and it would give me an answer? And now I've got this thing, a Samsung. Yeah. It's got a cracked screen, but this thing has the world on it. Yeah. And so for a guy like me, yeah. who was born in 1956, and I'll tell you what's even cooler, I've been the biggest space buff ever since I was six years old. And I remember Buzz Aldrin when he landed. Now, how could I ever dream in a million years that 35 years later, I would be having a private breakfast with Buzz Aldrin in one of the ships out here at Pearl Harbor. Uh, actually, it was uh, Aloha Tower. Just Buzz and me for two hours. And there's photos on my website. And I wrote a story about it. But, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that's happened in my life. It's just incredible. And, uh, and one of these days I hope to get a memoir out because uh, <laughs> it's just the things I've seen in, the, in my lifetime has just been amazing. Well, I look forward to getting that, uh, that book uh, whenever it does come out. Yeah, me too. Be fascinating <laughs> read. Just uh, have Ron ghostwrite it for you. Or just dictate it to Ron. He'll write, he'll write it down. He's got some great ideas. He's got some great ideas. Great, great. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, it's fascinating, but let's go ahead and move on to our next topic. Uh, talk about the 85 millimeter f 1.4 art lens by Sigma. Uh, Ron, you recommended this topic. So, what do you think of this lens? Sure. Right this now, I have a, uh, yeah, I, I shoot a Canon 1.8 right now, 85 1.8 for my portraits, and mm -hmm. uh, I like it. But I sure wouldn't, and I don't want to spend for the 1.2. And uh, the 1.4 is only a thousand dollars, so uh, only a thousand dollars. Yeah, I got, that, yeah. <laughs> I got that in my pocket. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think it's a happy medium, and I, I uh, according to the reviews, it looks like a good lens, and um, I, I wouldn't mind picking one up when I get a thousand dollars together. Um, Zach, maybe you should ask the company to borrow that lens for yeah, you. We, we Sigma sponsors the podcast. I hope we all get uh, one. Uh, Lens of I, our choice. I, I've been I've been trying to get uh, I've been trying to talk to Sigma for years ever since I worked at B and H Photo Video about about trying to borrow some of their gear or become a sponsored photographer because I've had the I had the thirty one four before the Art Lens series loved it because it was like three hundred dollars used and it was gorgeous um, especially for shooting video and then I bought the thirty five millimeter one four Art Lens and it is possibly one of the best lenses. I've ever come across um, and that's all the stuff I've just never owned but also been able to access at camera stores and stuff like that it's it's incredible so the 85 I yeah I've been dying for this lens for basically since they came out with the 35 and yeah as soon as I can swing it I just bought a car so it's gonna be a little while <laughs> well if you just sell the car you can buy the lens <laughs> well I owe like 15 grand on it so uh, it'll be a little while <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, speaking of sponsors, we're not being sponsored by this company, but I just want to uh, point out this camera bag right here that I'm, I'm traveling with. It's the uh, from Mindshift. Uh, it's a it's a pretty cool camera backpack thing, and I'm gonna do a review on it here soon. Um, so far, early impressions are I'm kind of I'm pretty happy with it. It's got this little like bag compartment here that you kind of you pull out while you're 
they're shooting. Anyways, full review, forthcoming, but I want to make sure because they're sending send, send that to me for me to test. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, anyways, um, so the 1.485 millimeter, is this, you know, is this the lens you would use? Uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've never used a, a 1.485 uh, millimeter. I have a 1.450 millimeter, which I love. But what's the what's the difference? What's the benefit of the 85 millimeter? How, how is it so much different? Why would I get it if I already have a 50 millimeter? You talking to me? Take that on? <laughs> I'm talking to anybody who wants to answer that question. I've um, yeah. I've used the, the I've used the 85 Nikkor lens. Um, it's a great lens for low light and blowing your backgrounds out. Um, it's it's a really nice uh, it's a nice uh, sort of head and shoulders lens. But um, I think nowadays it's not so important to have this fast glass. But these sensors are so sensitive that and the stabilization you're getting, you know, it's it's not such a big deal anymore. I mean, uh, I found that I'm using uh, fast glass a lot less than I used to because. You can just boost up your ISO so easily. I think the important thing, is it really is about the image. It's about the picture you're trying to capture. You spend too much time playing with your gear, you know, you're kind of losing sight of, of, uh, of what you're doing with your subject. And um, it, 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 I think after a while you sort of know your gear like your third hand. You, don't, you shouldn't be thinking about gear. You should be thinking about how to uh, interpret what you have felt inside of you. Because a lot of people ask me, well, how did you shoot that? Or how did you compose that? It's not about that. It's, it's, I don't like to say you're taking a picture. I like to say you're feeling a photo. And so let's say you see something touches you. It could be a cute picture. It could be a sad picture. If you can capture that image the second that you felt that moment in you, it chances are it's gonna to relate to another person. And to do that is very difficult and you always hear about the decisive moment, but I think it's more like the pre-decisive moment they're gonna do before they even know themselves. And a perfect example is, you might have a puddle of water, okay, and there's a kid coming, and there's a, there's a phone line with a bunch of birds, and there's a homeless guy coming and rolling a shopping cart. Now what's gonna happen? Well, you could say, wow, there's a, there's a homeless man, I'll take a picture of him. Or you're looking at the birds. Or, you know, maybe you're trying to get a reflection. What's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. The kid's going to step in that water. He's going to splash it. The birds are going to scatter. The old man, uh, the homeless man, is going to look up at the birds. And what you've got to do is time that at the split second all that happens. Now, if you can think about that before it happens, you're going to capture it. The problem with a lot of photographers, especially street photographers, they're wandering around like zombies with their brand new Leicas, and they're clicking from their hip. And I, and I look online, and I look on Instagram, and all I see is millions of pictures of crooked people walking in the streets. And okay, if there's something interesting about them that you know adds something to my life a little bit for the day, then fine. But I mean, how many pi pictures of people falling over can you see? And it's, it's something you have to think. You have to think, you have to feel. And so it's not so much about the gear. It's not how fast the aperture is. I mean, it's, it, and sometimes pictures are better blurry. They've got more of an avant-garde kind of feel to it, you know, it's kind of fuzzy. I mean, uh, I think, um, uh, I forgot his name. There's a photographer I saw not long ago uh, that, that had a nice book. It was a lot of fuzzies. There, there, it has a lot of feeling, a lot of passion. So uh, my suggestion is don't get wound up with the gear so much. The gear is nice. Uh, if you're a professional, you know what you need. But if you're a street photographer, if you're trying to capture the decisive moment, you've got to feel, you've got to learn about yourself. You've got to know who you are as a person. You know, what's inside of you so that you can relate that what's in other people. And so that's what I try to do. I try to tell a story with a single photo that gets a little message out. And it's very hard to do, and I still struggle with it, to try to capture that moment. So as far as the lens, yeah, the, the fast glass is great. The newest Leica lenses are great. The, the, the fastest, the mirrorless, body, all the technology is fantastic. I love it. I love to play with this stuff. I, I, I started out loving cameras more than just taking pictures when I was six years old. But what I'm saying is, it's the moment. It's not even you. It's the moment. It's capturing the moment. How are you going to capture the soul of your subject and translate it into a digital file? And so that's my, my sermon for the day as far as that's concerned. 
So, Amen. There, take it. Amen. It's not about the equipment. It's about the, the this equipment behind the brain. Um, <laughs> Sigma for you. <laughs> but, you know, I was looking, I, I've never really followed Sigma art lenses. I, honestly, I I have my my stock core, you know, lenses that I've used for my Canon 5D Mark II. You know, the three stock zooms and a couple, you know, lenses, tertiary lenses. But honestly, I, I've never really explored the art series. Um, are there any other lenses in the art series that you would want, Ron? Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at their catalog here. They've got a lot of great stuff besides the 85 millimeter. Any of these that you would want? 35 millimeter would be a nice one to have. Um, I'd probably be happy with that. The 35 and the 85, I think I get a lot done with that. But like he says, I, Jeff's been really uh, taking me to task about my love of gear, and I, I should have more of a love of photography rather than photographic gear. Yeah. So uh, I'm having to rethink some of my ideas here. <laughs> Did he scold you for all your cheap Asian equipment? I, I didn't show him my cheap Chinese stuff yet. He doesn't know about that, but thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> no problem. I'll give you guys something to talk about after the show. Uh, Zach, any, any new equipment purchases or, or interests for you? I know, obviously, the car is the main equipment purchase you're dealing yeah. with. But. I mean, that actually, I mean, the you know, you were talking about, Jeff, like that for me, the biggest equip the best purchase that i did this year was a new car um because now it physically allows me to much more comfortably get to where my subjects are i had a choice because i i'm my gear is getting really close to kind of its its old age i always buy everything used um i mean the the gold rings have fallen off of both of my nikon lenses that's how rough they are um <laughs> the, red ring, the red ring falling off my one of my yeah basically ones. same thing um i actually just they got it's got sprung off and I finally just said, screw it and yanked it off. Um, it was taped on for a little while. Um, but uh, so I have like no resale value on these lenses. But uh, um, once they lose the ring, they're worthless. Yeah, but the thing was I had a, uh, a really crappy Chevy that was gonna break down at a given point. So I finally was just like, I had to say, this is the best way that I can actually cover my stories. And, and so as opposed to buying a whole new kit of lenses, it was a car, unfortunately. So, <laughs> smart, yeah. smart man, you get to where the photos are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's the uh, that's that's the you know, especially living in upstate New York, where there ain't. It's really tough to find anything local news here, wise that people care about. So, yeah, I got to go other places. <laughs> we should do an episode on uh, gear and then just talk about cars. <laughs> I got my I got my uh, Kia uh, Forte. Um, it has a uh, a back back camera on it. <laughs> the backup camera is great. F two point eight, uh, thirty five millimeter. It's great. Yep. Uh, there was a fake uh, movie trailer for a movie that was shot only with the backup camera on a car. Yep. I thought that was pretty funny. All right. Well, that pretty much wraps up our show for this evening. Uh, Jeff, I want to thank you so much for being on the show, as well as Ron. Uh, thank you for being on the show too. Uh, Zach, always happy to have you on as our co-host. Um, always great to have you on. Uh, Jeff, where can, you, know, you mentioned your Instagram. Uh, please tell us all about where people who want to can learn more about your work and, and find out about what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, my website uh, is jeffwidener.com. And all you got to do is go there. There's an Instagram link right there, a Facebook link. And uh, that's pretty much... Uh, I've started to write, I've actually started adding stories. So I've got six stories on there that might be of interest to some folks. Um, so uh, check that out. Check out the website. Check out Instagram. Let me know what you think. And uh, thanks for having me on. It's been great. Let me ask you this, Jeff. You know, you said you just went on Instagram only a few weeks ago. What was sort of the impetus there to, to jump on? I mean, Instagram has been around for a few years. Well, what kind of drove you? well I've been, it's a way to promote my work and uh, to get the word out there I I may want to start doing some uh, some photo safaris maybe some uh, seminars and I think if I get a lot of followers this might be one way of doing it it's a, it's a very good way to attract uh, you know interested photographers so I'm just trying to work that you know I'm old school so I've got a lot of young guys helping me get into the modern age here and uh, telling me what to do and and like Ron's been very helpful on some of this stuff so um, I'm just trying to get in with the groove here and trying to catch up, capture and catch up to the, to the present century. So, 
That's where we're trying to, trying to hang out with all the fellow kids. Uh, okay, uh, Ron, where can people find you? Oh, please do. Look at my Instagram, and Monday I might update it. Uh, <laughs> my Instagram is Ron Photo Hawaii, and uh, you can also catch me sometimes on Eagle News in the Philippines on Net25 if you're so inclined. Uh, we will be live uh, on uh, 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, which is on Wednesday, the 7th. Awesome. I'm going to be out there uh, doing some broadcasting from Pearl Harbor uh, for the uh, commemoration ceremonies that are taking place. Is that, that so going to be a pretty that. big event going on? Is that they got a big pl event planned for that day? Yeah, it's a, a week-long thing. That, that's a week-long thing. Uh, some of our Hawaii Bureau members were out there today, but I chose to spend my afternoon with Jeff instead of uh, making money. So. <laughs> I know your priorities, Zach. <laughs> people, people first. Um, that's great. Uh, yeah, I, I know CBS Sunday Morning did a great uh, piece on the Pearl Harbor and a pretty big. We just actually had our 75th anniversary of our base um, not too long ago this year. So uh, definitely an important milestone to recognize. Um, there was something you mentioned I was going to bring up. Now I can't remember what it is. Zach, people, tell people how they can find out more about you. Uh, as always, uh, uh, ZDRoberts.com, uh, ZDRoberts on Twitter and all the socials, um, and, uh, and of course, always at AroundTheLens.com. And I'll have, uh, hopefully up uh, tonight or tomorrow, I'll have a kind of uh, last two weeks of the election post up on uh, Around the Lens, and then we'll be having a, uh, uh, probably next week, be having a like holiday uh, gear fest, uh, like what you should get a photographer if you have somebody in your family. So... <laughs> a post up for that so yes indeed I've, I've contributed a little bit to that so i'm looking forward to seeing how that uh, comes together <clears throat> run okay now i remember i want to ask you so you know when i'm looking i put like your guys whatever your websites on to the panelist section on the, on the pages right so when i was trying to find your website to put on there i googled your name and i came up to a website called ronhamiltonphoto.com does that have anything to do with you I don't think so. You know, there's a lot of Ron Hamilton photographers out there. I'll tell you that. I get a lot of weird email thanking me for the bar mitzvah photos. And <laughs> I said, wow, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I get uh, you know, stories, people saying thank you so much for this and that, or you did a bad job on this or that. And I, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm more of a news guy. I don't, I don't do those kind of things, you know, but thank you. you know? uh, so no, that Ron, wasn't me, that one. Here's a golden idea for a podcast for you. I want you to find out all the other Ron Hamilton photographers. <laughs> at least four, at least three more. Not only Ron Hamilton, but Ron H. A lot of different Ron H's out there. There's there's a guy in Maui and, and in Hawaii. There's a Ron H in Maui. There's a Ron H on the Big Island, and I'm Ron H in Oahu. And oh uh, yeah, so yeah, it's it's crazy. It's evidently a popular name for photographers. We'll find three yeah. more Ron H photographers or three Ron Hamilton photographers. Get them all together. <laughs> weekly podcast, the Ron Hamilton Show. It'll be great. <laughs> there all right. you go. We'll all get together. Uh, we'll get together. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyways, my name is David J. Murphy. You can find me at djmphoto.com or as always at aroundthelens.com to see anything that we're doing out there. We've got a lot of stuff great going on. We've got new stuff that we're working on in the pipeline. We've got a whole bunch more shows for the rest of the year. We're going to do a, a retrospective sort of best of the year on December 26th. That's going to be sort of a special episode. Then we'll start up again. Uh, new episodes every Monday going on for the next year and beyond. You can see all the uh, episodes we have planned for the next year on our events page on Facebook. Uh, again, we got a lot, a lot of great stuff going on. I just finished out the panelist section on our website. So if you want to see what any panelist, every panelist who's been on the show, and also go right to the episode they've been on, uh, you can do that. So go check that out at aroundthelens.com. Again, I want to thank our guests on tonight, Jeff, Ron, uh, as always, my co-host, Zach. Thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Again, my name has been David J. Murphy. This has been Around the Lens, episode 53, and we are out.